stores. So one of them, Deacon Iyo, when he preached a few weeks ago, and his preaching was amazing. Even some parents approached me and said, when is Iyo gonna teach again? So this is the second chance given to, for Deacon Iyo. Please give him a round of applause. Administrator of St. Mary's Cathedral here in Toronto. My father's the priest, my brother's the deacons, the Zamirat, and all faithful servants. In Demina Darachu. Amin Yam Naka Chen Samayat Yetanasa Amin. Last week, we learned from our deacon, Yonatan, about how Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, is important in our lives and how we cannot do anything without him. And the story that came with this is about when St. Peter decided to start fishing. And he was a wonderful fisher. He can always catch them every time. But the time he decided to deny God and to go out to fish, he didn't catch any. He didn't catch any fish. Absolutely nothing. But when God came, when Jesus Christ took form of a human and told him, go back and fish again, he went there with the other disciples and they caught 153 fish. This story, this idea is that we cannot do anything without our Lord. So, what we're going to learn today is about the discussion between St. Peter as well as Jesus Christ. I'll be reading from John chapter 21, verses 15 to the end. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he says, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lamb. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you tr truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, dressed yourself and went to where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciples whom Jesus loved was following them. By, by loved, there was a specific disciple, which everyone assumed was Jesus' favorite. He was John. He even had a title name, John the Beloved. Continuing on, when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread around the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I wanted him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that could, could be written. 
This is the word of God. So, what can we learn out of this? At the start of this, Jesus asked John and Peter, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because of this. But why? Why is he hurt? Why did he ask three times? The reason is not because it's the Holy Trinity, but because Peter has denied God three times. So, to him, when he heard the third time, he's wondering to himself. He feels targeted. He feels targeted. He feels like, oh, Jesus is telling me about what he knows because he's omnipresent. He's always there. He'll know what you're doing. He's talking about every single time I deny him. But on top of that, he also tells him, feed my lamb. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Now, he's giving him the role of a shepherd, but it's not only to the sheep, it's to the believers. He's asking him to take care of the believers, trust in them, and as well as take care of them. Make, them, make sure they go down the right path. So, this is also a role for our one and only Abuna Dimitros. He guides us, tells us what we should do, what we should not do, and let us go through the right path, which is the path of God. And this is how you love, how you truly love God. Show compassion. We had a lesson before during the Lent song about talents. We need to use our talents. We use Abuna Dimitros was given the talents to help us all and to become an archbishop and teach us about the word of God. So, unlike him, I am not an archbishop. I cannot always teach you about everything, but I've been given the role and the talents to preach, to call out God's name, and to help you all call out his name as well. So, you should use your talents, and your talents is a way of showing true love to God. And one thing I want to address to the adults of this church. One time, I went downstairs to do baptism, and the priest, he asks the people who wants their son to be baptized, do you have a baptismal father or mother? And they said, La Mariam. I give it to Mary. I give it to this church. Of course, that's a great thing, give it to this church. But they need a God parent, a God figure. They need someone who can guide them. Through this time, these children are being exposed to many things in this world. So they need someone to guide them down the right path, someone to tell them, oh, this is what you do. This is not what you do. This is very important. We also need this from Abuna Dimitros. The believers needed it from the apostles. So the newborn babies, the people who are going to be the future of our church, they need a godparent who can guide them and teach them in the right way. So continuing from there, Jesus predicts something for St. Peter. He tells him, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are older, you will stretch out your arms and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. So, to put this into simpler terms, when you're young, you're fully energized. So, you can put clothes on yourself, but when you get older, like your grandparents, your father and mother, maybe they need a little help. So, they stretch out their arms like this and you dress them, you help them out. What Jesus says about this to Peter, he says, to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. So, what does this mean? He says that Peter will die glorifying God, but most definitely will be stretching out his arm. And if you look into the past of the, spirit, uh, the church, history of the church, and about the people, St. Peter was crucified exactly like that. There was only one difference. He was crucified upside down. And why did he do this? Why would he make himself suffer even more than he has to? By suffering upside down. Well, you can think of it like this. When the priests sit in the front row, when they stand and they start praying with you all, do you guys stand in the front row with them? No. You guys are all at least one row behind, or you stand right to the side of the, that row. It is a show of respect. It is, it's a sign that we respect our priest and archbishop of Dimitros. This is what Peter is doing for his teacher, his Messiah, Jesus. He says, 
He's my teacher, my Lord. I don't deserve to die the same way he does. So, continuing on from there, this is what Jesus has prophesied for him, his future death. So, he tells him, follow me. Then Peter follows him, and then he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. And who is this? This was none other than John, the beloved. He asked Jesus, what about him? How is he going to die? Jesus replies to him saying, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Basically, he told them, mind yourself, worry about yourself, don't worry about him. He tells him, and to further on talk about this, when the person who's writing this is John, and when he speaks about himself, he speaks himself in a humility, with humility and no boasting. He doesn't boast himself. He doesn't say, oh, I'm going to live forever because Jesus indicates this. He speaks with kindness and humility. We should all take examples of him. We should all be, have humility like this. If we, if we score a perfect score on a test, if we do really good in a basketball game, soccer game, whatever it is, we don't boast to others who did bad. We just keep our own business and then mind ourselves. So, continuing on from this. There's rumors now between the disciples. Oh, Jesus said that John is going to live forever until he comes back. All the believers were saying this. But there was a misunderstanding with this. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? So, he's not directly telling us, oh, he's going to live forever. He's telling us indirectly, if I want it to happen, you cannot do anything about it, you should mind yourself. So, there's one fact that we do know about John, is that we've never seen his body yet, anywhere, any bones, nothing. So, we cannot say for sure if he's risen until he can come back to die to glorify God again, but this is something that is unsure of all of us, still a mystery. And then finally, Jesus, Jesus has done many miracles. And John said that this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. So he's the one who wrote them down. He's speaking about himself. Then he says, we know that his testimony is true. So he's saying all the miracles Jesus has done, everything good deeds he's done is all true and he's witnessed them. So he can testify for them. So... He also lastly says that Jesus did many other things, many miracles that we don't even know about, many good deeds, but it cannot be all written in the Bible because there's just simply not enough space. We don't have that space, but we do. what we do know is Jesus has done a lot for us and that we should glorify Him every more because He's such a caring, loving God for all of us. The final message for John chapter 21, the idea of this is to help St. Peter return to his apostolic duties. And what we can learn out of this is that we are nothing without God. We have no life. There's no potential in us. There's nothing. So, we also learn that we must use our talents and always glorify Him. May the Lord be with us all. Guys, are you happy with the sermon presented by the Canillo? Put your hands together and let me see. As you see today, in the Divine Liturgy, that's it, in the Divine Liturgy, or Kedase, Deacon Yob served as the first deacon, holding a processional cross, chanting San Liu, Tan Su, and so on. And at the end, based on today's gospel reading, which is Gospel of John, chapter 21st, the last part, in which the Lord Jesus restored Peter to his apostolic mission. And Peter was told to feed the lambs, to tend the sheep and so on. And three times he was asked, because as Vicarillo wonderfully 
said, when the Lord entrusted this duty of being a shepherd, by extension, the same power was given to our bishops like our bishop, His Grace Abuna Dimetros. That's why he mentioned Abuna Dimetros. Like Saint Peter, our father Abuna Dimetros received episcopal power to take care of the flock because a bishop is the shepherd of the flock of Christ. And why Christ asked Peter three times whether he loved him or not is not to remind him that Peter denied him three times. As Peter thought, Peter was asking, why is he asking me three times? The purpose was to give him, you know, authority to look for children like you, kids, lambs, and the young, the youth, and then the elderly ones. Every bishop is entrusted that way. That's why our bishops, during their ordination, even take the names of the apostles. Abuna Dimitros used to be called Abba Kiros. When he was ordained, he was given the name of an Alexandrian bishop, Abba Dimitros. Some bishops are named after John, Johannes. Some of them are called Matthews and Peter, because our bishops are the successors of our mothers, the apostles. My second point is our Orthodox Church is a good example for helping you just grow spiritually. You know, in our church, as soon as infants are baptized, we let them partake of the Holy Communion. We don't say like the Catholic Church, you should wait till you are 13 to partake of the Holy Communion. There is no you know, partial membership in the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church raises you, nurturing you spiritually, physically, this spiritual nourishment through the sacrament of baptism and Holy Eucharist help you be grafted in the binary who is our Lord Jesus Christ. So you are the future of the Church and we look forward for your spiritual service. Thank you for your time and attention now. Now you can leave downstairs, Deacon. Uh